Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Diana Sinton. I'm the Executive Director of UCGIS, the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science. And I welcome you today to our penultimate session in our 2020 symposium. All of these activities would have been part of our programming at our annual event uh, this year, which would have taken place in Honolulu, Hawaii. Instead, you're probably listening to this from some other non-Hawaiian island. But in any case, we are very happy that we've been able to offer so much of our programming on this um, through these uh, virtual sessions, these digital sessions. And I would like very much to introduce uh, the speaker for this particular uh, next session, um, Dr. David Cowan, from, uh, retired from the University of South Carolina. Uh, as a quick reminder, uh, your microphones will remain muted during the session. Please feel free to type out a question into the question space. Uh, and I know that this has been designed with a little bit of time for some questions at the end. If we, if we run out of time, uh, we will make sure that we keep track of the questions and respond afterwards. We do have another session starting right at the bottom of the hour. Okay, so with that, I will turn it over to David. It's all yours. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. Uh, Diana, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, I can. Yep. Good. Great. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining me in this discussion about the role of academic libraries in providing GIS services. Um, I'm proud to be a fellow of UC GIS and one of, actually one of the six founding fathers of the organization. Um, I did retire from the University of South Carolina uh, 12 years ago, but I did put 38 years there. Um, fortunately, Jack Dangerman finds tasks to keep me busy. So Esri is a good affiliate member of UC GIS and is concerned about the needs for higher education. Clearly, it's in Esri's best interest to provide products and services that support the education mission because, in fact, you're training the labor force. Um, if we were in Honolulu, okay, and I'd, we'd be wearing our, our, our Hawaiian shirts and we'd be having a good time, but if we were there, there would have been six people there. There would have been six people in a panel that was organized by Jessica Benner and Emma Slayton at Carnegie Mellon. Um, the panel would be discussing uh, centralized GIS units at universities. We would have had representatives from Penn State, from Carnegie Mellon, uh, Oklahoma, UC Santa Barbara, and Princeton, a great group of people. Okay. In fact, if we had been there, we probably would see Jessica, Jessica would be highlighted in, in her exciting new project that she and uh, Emma Slayton are doing. This is funded by the National Center for Research and Geographic Education, um, playing the role of the role of libraries and promoting this kind of non-traditional um, non-traditional teaching activities that take place in libraries. Uh, Nathan at Penn State would be talking about his partnership with the, of the library with the geography department, and he'd probably be emphasizing the fact that over the last five years, he's had a 436% growth in requests for services from the library. Um, Werner would be telling us about his exciting new project dealing with uh, spatial discovery of research data. Uh, a tradition that's been at UC Santa Barbara since 1994. Uh, I'm not quite sure what we would hear from Jeffrey at Oklahoma or Dr. Shawa at Princeton, but I'm pretty impressed with what happens at Princeton. Um, they actually offer 19 workshops, okay, and these include Esri products as well as open source products. They include GIS, remote sensing, and uh, some analytical functions as well. Um, let's talk about Esri for a moment. Um, there's only 2,500 academic libraries with site licenses. Uh, kind of interesting. I did an analysis. 100 of the 101 Carnegie One research universities have Esri site licenses. So from Esri's viewpoint, what level of service uh, is being provided at the libraries? And really, more importantly, what can, what can we do to foster additional utilization? So 
But that, I, I dug a little deeper. And in fact, this little arrow points down to the fact that there may be 12,000 colleges and universities that are potential ESRI users. Um, so methods, about a year and a half ago, I started plugging into the uh, literature, found 180 documents relating to this topic. Uh, I did an extensive analysis of services that are provided at various, from various websites and other things. I talked to people, I did email exchanges, I visited a couple of places. Uh, I also conducted a survey we, with the education team at Esri. We did an open uh, a, a survey, an online survey. Didn't get as many responses as we wanted, but we're 28 responses from people that are, you know, there. So I said this was like a fo focus group. Um, and I think that was pretty interesting. I looked at some of the mission statements for uh, libraries, and it's kind of interesting. The library is a place that promotes interdisciplinary GIS education. They still collect and curate spatial data. Um, sort of interesting that Arizona State, you know, they have a map and geospatial hub, and he says, uh, we tell stories with maps and data. I think that's a great phrase. And then they help students uh, and faculty with GIS tasks, finding data, giving presentations to classes. Um, but actually, they also do other things. They support GIS Day. Many universities, GIS Day is run out of the library. There's classroom training sessions. And there are cases where the, the university site license is actually maintained by the library. So let's talk about the history of uh, uh, academic libraries and kind of the starting point would be uh, in 1992 the American Research Library Association did a GIS literacy project uh, this was sponsored by Esri and other uh, companies uh, this was an, an initiative to get things going uh, 31 universities originally pre pre uh, were involved but as many as 121 over the next decade um, sort of interesting at that time there was ArcView 1 and uh, Tiger files were available so it was possible you know the cost of entry was pretty low um, there was somebody optimistically thought that in five years GIS technology would be widespread among the libraries but let's look at things now it's sort of interesting every Ivy League University has a GIS center most of those are in the library uh, at Yale, uh, Miriam Oliveris is doing just a wonderful job there. They had a GIS day that lasted three days. Um, um, Miriam has also established a kind of interesting group um, that does, uh, they, they've called it the Story Map Cafe. Um, wonderful things going on at Yale. Uh, sort of an indication of the demand for services from libraries is the number of job openings. I looked at this one afternoon, I browsed around. This is just a sampling with titles on them. There are 48 job openings the afternoon that I looked at that. Um, I want to emphasize an uh, interesting person, maybe, maybe some of you know her, Julie Sweetkind Singer. Uh, the thing that's interesting is Julie is the manage, she manages the Banner Earth Sciences Library and Map Collections, and she oversees uh, spatial data and resources at Stanford in their geospatial center. What's interesting is that NGAC, the National Geospatial Advisory Group, the most important advisory group in the country, chose Julie to be its chair. Okay, so we've got a librarian who did a wonderful job of bringing her expertise uh, to that organization. Well, I put together a timeline of, a, of important activities that have taken place in terms of academic libraries. I'll just highlight a couple of them. 1980, a group of the American Research Library Association the map and geography round table we'll get back to them in a moment i'm going to comment that the esri site license has had a huge impact on academic libraries the ability to share across the campus without additional fees uh, a special issue of the journal of, of academic librarianship in 1995 uh, the then in, in 2004 a new journal the journal of map and Library and geography libraries provided a nice outlet for people to talk about what was going on. Uh, 2010, the group that's now called Magritte, say instead of the map and geography round table, it's the geographic information round table. And they held a symposium that said, GIS in every library, let's make it happen. 
I would also highlight Esri story maps and geo blacklight. And we'll get to those things in a moment. Um, as I looked at that, I thought, well, this is really just the diffusion of innovation. Everett Rogers famous uh, model of how technology and information diffuses over time. How we move from early uh, innovators and those people who adopt it, taking on some new technology. And then we go through this curve until we finally have saturation and we've converted the laggards, okay? And I got some dates on here, they're up for debate, but maybe we start in 1992 with the, G the GIS Literacy Project as an early innovator, 2004 having its journal, 2010 this, this thought that we're gonna push, you know, let's make it happen, let's put, put GIS services in every library, and then maybe around 2015 when we get um, all the, the hurdles for entry are uh, taken care of. Um, 1994, UC Santa Barbara, uh, the Alexandra Digital Library Project with a new term, okay, and Mike Goodchild probably was responsible for this, a geo library, a library containing geo reference objects and a search mechanism based on geographic location. Kind of an important step. Okay, uh, around 1999, the National Research Council, the Mapping Science Committee held a workshop. Um, Mike organized this, and it was all about how will we distributed geographic uh, geo libraries provide instruction and assistance into the future. And we'll talk about that a little bit. A major assessment in 1995 indicated that the learning curve was very steep for librarians. Uh, often it would take a minimum of 15 hours or more to get some basic function done. In many cases, this was daunting to them. And if you go and look at the literature at that time, people were advocating you needed to have two master's degrees in order to actually uh, provide services. Um, so the curve, you know, it's, things don't move along in a, a nice steady progression. Some of the organizations that, that started with the uh, uh, GIS literacy project, never established permanent GIS facilities in their libraries. Um, sort of an interesting combination, you know, you know uh, some glitches along the way, let's, let's say that. Uh, 2006, okay, maybe a big change with the emergence of websites. So then it became possible for the library to be the focal point for GIS activity, okay, and do it by um, at least posting resources from you know, the Esri uh, recents, re, excuse me. Um, so we move ahead and let's talk a little bit more about Magritte, this map in Geospatial Information Roundtable of the American Research Libraries. Uh, this is the world's largest map in geospatial library organization. Um, it was founded in 1980 and it has 300 members, very active group of people. And as I say, in 2010, they had this neat uh, symposium in Washington where they said, GIS in every library, let's make it happen. Okay, and you can see Esri was one of the sponsors as well as some other geospatial organizations. But that, I felt that was sort of a turning point where he says, okay, we've gone through the, the innovators and the early majority, and then we're saying, okay, let's make this thing happen. So you're addressing the rest of the people Okay, and they have, you know, there's, a, there's a, every one of their little bulletins, a bulletin called Baseline, uh, has interesting cartoons um, done by Jim Combs. And so this was their 30th anniversary of doing things, and uh, I thought that was pretty clever. Um, another person that I've, that I've talked to, Jim Boxall at Dalhouse University in Halifax, you know, and he was an ed on the editorial board, I believe, of the journal, and he says, this is our geographic moonshot. This is our time. This is the time for librarians. Seize the moment and let's make it happen. So I thought that was sort of, you know, invigorating people. So we got jump ahead to 2015. A major uh, survey was taken in 2015 by Ann Holstein. And she says, basically, if we looked at the academic librarians in the 70s or 80s, We'd see a bunch of drawers with map cases and all kinds of things. And now what you're going to find is a bustling geospatial center. Okay, uh, so she went out and did a survey in, in 2015, five years ago, 
uh, sort of this thought that wasn't a question of whether there were going to be GIS services, but what level of service would be provided. Clearly, Esri software was an important function there, uh, but also things like Google Map and some open source GIS stuff uh, was also important. They included this table, and I think it's illustrative too. Um, users of academic libraries for GIS services. Here's 22 different disciplines. A lot of the business majors will come to the library to get services. History, nursing, medicine, sociology. I think that's a, a, a great idea. Uh, I talked about Migret, Margaret of uh, being a promoter, but you know, in Everett Rogers' model, how do you move from innovation to saturation and converting all the laggards? You need change agents. And again, I list these, the Esri site license, uh, simple applications, ArcView certainly was a game changer, um, free federal data and enlightened policy that Tiger and the USGS digital line graphs. Um, GIS activities are pretty taxing on, on computer hardware, but we've seen the capacity grow so we can support you know, processing LIDAR and lots of large data sets. Inexpensive storage, cloud computing, software as a service. You don't even have to install the software on a computer anymore. Google Maps had a huge impact on society. And I think from Esri's viewpoint, ArcGIS Online, the Living Atlas with its 4,000 authoritative layers, Story Maps. I don't know if you know this, but uh, according to Alan Carroll last week, they reached 1.25, one and a, one and a quarter million story maps have been produced. And these are just the ones that have been published and viewable by the general public. So let's get to the end of the curve there. So we get a situation in which, uh, how do we convert the laggards? And I think this is a really interesting little article by Callagher and Gamble in 2017 at, a, at just at the uh, New College of Florida, not a very big place down in, uh, I think it's over on the west coast of Florida. Um, good story maps, okay? Simple and powerful format. They provide an, an opportunity for a library with very, very low risk, successful outcomes in less than an hour. And another interesting thing is that a lot of people see the GIS, getting GIS services from a library as a very neutral kind of in, endearing, friendly environment. So let's talk about some new opportunities, geographic search, data management, and GIS light applications. Going back to the work of Julie and her group at Stanford, um, they seized the moment there by, by taking open source, this thing called Blacklight, okay, open source uh, search engine stuff, put a geographic front end on it, and made something called Geo Blacklight, a spatial search by study area created to satisfy the user needs and requirements of librarians. And Stacy Maples, who I think I see his name is on uh, the attendee list this afternoon, I talked to him one day and he said the beautiful thing about Geo Blacklight is you get sort of a book on the shelf experience. So as you wandered into a library and you're looking for a specific uh, call letter, then you go to that shelf and say, oh, look at there's other things that are interesting to me as well. So there's a lot of these portals using Geo Blacklight. All the Big Ten universities, for example, Colorado, Cornell, uh, Wisconsin, NYU, Princeton, you know, this thing is you know, UT Austin. It's amazing, right? Of the people in my survey, eight of them were using uh, Geo Blacklight and emphasized the need to have a relationship between ArcGIS and Geo Blacklight. Another major area deals with long-term data storage and the role that librarians could play in this. And a, a great example of that is Nicole King at Purdue University, where she says we go through a life cycle from raw data collection to doing some analysis, publishing the results. But then the need, NSF is emphasizing the need that you have to preserve this data for the long term. So what are the challenges some of the librarians are finding? You know, they need more staff, they need better training facilities. Uh, trying to find qualified employees is a challenge. They want to go deeper into some of the analysis and they want to go wider and deeper in terms of that. Um, in terms of some recommendations, 
And these are recommendations specifically to ESRI, but I think they're all, all encompassing. So these are the things that are on the minds of, of GIS librarians. They want to integrate the search engine, especially around geo blacklight, and be able to go from ArcGIS and go through uh, our catalog and create metadata. Okay? They want more training courses. They want more historical data to be in their archives. Uh, they want better, better metadata support. They'd love to have more geocoding capability. They want to integrate the Living Atlas. Again, as I say, 4,000 layers of data there. They would like to have multiple users to edit a map. That's a bit of a problem, being able to collaborate. Some face-to-face -face training. They also want to branch out into new stuff, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Um, applications, they want more things to be web-based, more of the software as a service. They want to know, they want people to publish their best practices. And part of what's coming out of this particular session would have been more about best practices. They want to involve the humanities. They'd like to have multiple portals because sometimes you find out that people just don't play very nicely together. So we want to set up our own one. So in conclusion, uh, Holstein in her 2015 uh, survey said that libraries have truly established themselves as a go-to location. Uh, I talked about this with Mike Goodchild last week um, and talking about the whole uh, distributed geo libraries. And Mike made this observation, I think is a good one, essentially seeing GIS as a service right, rather than a research field. Right, that there are diverse organizational homes for supporting the activities. But um, that's sort of interesting, Mike seeing it as a service and libraries being a good place to get services. Um, and then my conclusion here will be that libraries represent the best choice, best choice for expanding GIS use on campus. Uh, and I highlight some of the work of Peter Noop at uh, University of Michigan. And we talked about this stuff. He's doing a wonderful job of entering classrooms and encouraging people. And we call it kind of the gateway drug, that a story map is a gateway drug. You do this, you get good result in maybe in a half an hour or so on. But then you want to dig deeper, right? So then you have to go in at Princeton, for example, you could go and get a, you know those 19 workshops. At other places, you would go to a geography department and become a major in GIS activities. So. I guess the bottom, the final analysis here would be that academic departments should form partnerships, okay, with the libraries. Don't think of them as rivals, think of them as introducing new people to things. And I think the example would be Nathan at, at Penn State, where you could encourage things. So I'd like to hear more about this, uh, your feelings about this. Uh, hopefully, I'll continue to be consulting with Esri about this so I can be helpful in that. So, Diana, that's it. Thanks, David. Thanks for uh, thanks for getting through all of that interesting uh, those interesting ideas and keeping on the t on time for us. If anyone has a question uh, for David, be, please uh, feel free to write something into the question space. I was able to forward. Stace um, was uh, is one of our attendees and was able to put the link for um, geo uh, backlight, I, I, uh, I might be stumbling over the name of that right at this moment, um, there in the question space. Uh, please know about that. It's a wonderful thing that uh, is being used more and more at libraries and in other venues as well. Uh, I think that um, UCGIS is particularly interested in uh, supporting additional activities uh, for our, all of our member institutions and for the higher ed community in general around um, geographic information science and libraries. And uh, we find too that is definitely uh, the one place on campuses that tends to be the central area of activity and one of the uh, most active areas. Okay, um, we will be keeping, this session has been recorded. If you want to refer back to any of the references that, um, that David cited, uh, you'll be able to um, take a look at this uh, presentation again. If there are no other questions at this moment, we're going to sign off. And we have another session starting, another UCGIS session for a symposium starting just in a couple of minutes. 
It's the community-based research experiences abroad for undergraduates. So if you're into citizen science uh, and work with um, UAVs and students and community mapping activities, you might want to hop over to that one. Thanks everyone very much for your time and we'll close up this session. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.